It's August the 4th, a special royal day, the birthday of Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. She usually appears soon after 11 o'clock, slowly walking out to acknowledge the cheers of her devoted admirers. Everyone wants to toast her health, including Ivor Spencer and his colleagues from the Guild of Professional Toastmasters. The band of the Grenadier Guards pays a special tribute, a march past playing Happy Birthday to You. Upstairs, the Queen Mother's housemaids have a bird's eye view. Now, children under the age of 12 are invited to come forward to offer their birthday greetings. And a long queue of youngsters laden with cards, bouquets and balloons soon forms. <laughs> All the Queen Mother's household, including her lady-in-waiting, Lady Angela Oswald, seen on the left, are kept busy carrying the blooms and gifts into her home. On the right, her chief steward, William Tallon, lends a hand. No one is left out, not even her favourite corgi. The midsummer sun beats down, making people half her 95 years begin to wilt but there is never a sign that the Queen Mother is even slightly affected. All the way to the Mall, she continues on a stroll that sometimes lasts more than half an hour. For an elderly lady who finds walking a trifle difficult, this could be an ordeal, but no one would ever guess. Come rain or come shine, she has never let her people down. After a brief rest, the family begins to arrive. Zara Phillips, her mother, Princess Anne, and along comes her husband, Commander Tim Lawrence. The Queen Mother's grandson, Viscount Lindley, drives in with his wife, Serena. And soon, they all walk out to join in this happy occasion. Then it's time to say goodbye, as they go inside for a birthday lunch, usually held in the garden. Winchester, St. Patrick's Day. The Queen Mother arrives to present shamrocks to the Irish Guards, as she does every year. It is one of the happiest engagements on her calendar. Reviewing the troops is more of a pleasure than a duty. The Queen Mother has always had a soft spot for military men. In World War I, three of her brothers served in the Black Watch and another with the Royal Scots Greys. The Queen Mother wears her shamrocks on her lapel. Officers pin them on their caps. Blue is her favorite color, and there is always a matching hat created by her milliner, Joy Quested Noel. 
Clothes are the Queen Mother's weakness. She was a fashion icon in the kind of way that people liked the fluff and the crinolines and the hats with the ostrich feather and the soft turquoise blue and the high heels, you know, with a sort of rather Minnie Mouse look. Um, to say that she was a fashion icon like Jackie Kennedy would be, of course, not true. The Queen Mother was born a commoner, the Honourable Elizabeth Bowes Lyon, ninth child of a Scottish peer, Lord Glams. The Bowes Lyons were a very old family, going back to God knows whom in Scotland, and they were also very rich. They'd come into money rather fortunately, as well as having a lot of land. And they owned several castles, a huge house in St James's Square in London. Interestingly enough, they weren't terribly impressed by the royal family. Her father didn't really think much of the royal family. So at the time that uh, there were thoughts that she might marry the royal family, he wasn't especially impressed by that because they were really aristocrats in their own right and had come down, they were descended from King Bruce of the Scots and so on. So really, very, very grand family. Yet her birth is shrouded in secrecy. It occurred somewhere in London, but she refuses to say where. There is one theory that she was born in an ambulance while her mother was en route to hospital. Her father finally registered her arrival at Hitchin in Hertfordshire near the family home at St Waldenbury, where he claimed she was born. No one learned the truth for 80 years. She was very close to her mother, and I think perhaps she was a bit spoiled because she was a very charming child, and all the servants adored her. She used to go into the kitchen and beg for extra jellies and cream and things like that. I think because of her great charm, she could get away with anything. On April 26, 1923, the Lady Elizabeth Bowes Lyon married Albert, Duke of York. She was very petite and small, and she had a, a pretty heart-shaped face and beautiful blue eyes and a lovely complexion and dark hair, which she wore in a rather old-fashioned way for those days with a fringe. But she had this sort of radiant attraction. She had this great power even then of making people feel that she was concentrating on them, that she was only interested in them, which is one of the most attractive qualities you can have. She was really the center of masculine attention. A lot of men were in love with her. She was a great Deb in her day. When he met her, he fell in love with her absolutely instantly. And he was, with all his failings, because he was a very diffident, very shy, very reserved man, but he was always a very determined man. And once having fallen in love with her, he was determined to marry her. So he asked her three times, and for the first two occasions she refused. She didn't really want to be caught in this kind of royal cage. She was a woman who was used to her independence. She didn't really want to lead the restricted kind of life which marrying into the royal family would mean. But he was very persistent, the Duke of York, and he simply kept at her and kept at her and kept at her. And in the end, she, she agreed. She really loved him. Um, he had a very vulnerable quality, which is very appealing to some women. And he did really need her. And then he was physically attractive. He had a very good figure. He danced very well. He was very athletic. He dressed very well. And he was a really a good guy. After the abdication of his older brother, Edward, in 1936, they became Queen Elizabeth and King George VI. The new queen became the saviour of the nation during World War II. As a result, Adolf Hitler called her the most dangerous woman in Europe. He felt that she had the king, by then King George VI, under her thumb. Um, he thought that she was, as indeed she was, a very strong-minded woman and that, uh, that her husband, though King George VI, was a rather weak-minded weak -minded man. And so um, Hitler was very conscious of the fact that she might have been the power behind the throne. Hitler was very conscious that she was a woman of considerable strength of character, which indeed she was. Another day, another arrival. After a lifetime of flags flying in her honor and bands playing, she is enormously thrilled by it all.
may be just another working day for the Queen Mother, but she knows it's very special for those she meets. She takes her duties seriously. Work is the rent you pay for life, she tells her family. Ex-servicemen with medals glinting in the sun get a special word. Fifty years have passed since World War II, but she remembers it as our finest hour. One of the Queen Mother's great achievements was to bring America into the war on Britain's side. When she charmed Americans on a tour of the United States in 1939, all isolationist talk of America staying out of the war disappeared overnight. The royal couple formed a bond of friendship with President Roosevelt, which, it is said, directly led to American support for Britain during the war. By choosing to remain in London throughout the Blitz and sharing the hardships of their people, the royal couple became symbols of Britain's fighting spirit. Elizabeth was even proud when Buckingham Palace received a direct hit. Now we can look the East End in the face, was the Queen's famous comment. King George died in 1952, and the Queen Mother has now been a widow far longer than she was a wife. Remembrance Sunday, the Cenotaph, Whitehall. The Queen leads the nation's homage to the fallen. The Queen Mother watches from the balcony of the Foreign Office above. Below, three royal princes stand to attention just before Big Ben strikes 11 o'clock. With her husband, King George VI, the Queen Mother was an unfailing symbol of courage in World War II. Now she has only memories. The solemnity and significance ends with the national anthem. It may be the November chill, but is there a trace of a tear in the Queen Mother's eye? A more joyous occasion is the Trooping the Colour ceremony, which takes place in June. En route to Horse Guards Parade, she is joined by Princess Diana and her younger son, Harry. A swaying carriage is not the most comfortable way to travel, especially for an elegant lady who takes helicopters like taxis. The nation's best loved lady may be as old as the century, but her eternal zest for life never changes. In public life, the Queen Mother never admits to feeling cold or tired. Illness is a bore, she says. Afterwards, the whole family and their guests, including some Mountbatten cousins, line up on the Buckingham Palace balcony to acknowledge the cheers of crowds in the Mall. Grandson Edward, the television producer Prince, often arranges to video the event so they can enjoy it all over again afterwards. Princess Margaret looks topping in a vivid hat. Down below, the band plays in the palace forecourt to keep everyone entertained.
Then it's all eyes on the skies as the RAF stages a fly past with smoke trails of red, white and blue. Derby Day at Epsom. In the royal box, the Queen and her mother are being filmed for a television documentary. But who cares about cameras when the best starters and riders in Britain are taking to the track? Any familiar faces down below in the paddock? Suddenly, something important catches the Queen's eye. She points and says, that's mine, that's my horse. If there is one thing these royal ladies share, it's a passion for the sport of kings and queens. But while the Queen Mother's horses are all steeplechasers, her daughter prefers racing on the flat. The Queen has won four of the five English classics, the Oaks, the 2000 Guineas, the St Ledger and the King George VI and Queen Elizabeth Diamond Stakes. Her racing colours are a purple body with gold braid, scarlet sleeves and black velvet cap with gold fringe. The Queen Mothers are blue with buff stripes, blue sleeves and black cap with gold tassel. When she's racing, she, her enthusiasm is always there. She's planned with her um, racing manager um, all the mating of her horses up to the year 2003, so I think she intends to be around for a while yet. I think she's got a core of steel. I think that she is a woman who is very conscious of what she's able to do. She is very feminine in some ways. She is almost a flirt, almost a tease, and I think she's been that all her life. The crowds love the procession down the track. Every chance she gets, the Queen takes to the saddle herself with a groom for company at Windsor. Later, she rides through the park in a carriage, en route to Ascot. Every day the race meeting is on, crowds gather at Watersplash Lane to see the royal party ride by. No lady can enter the race course without a hat, and there is every kind, from caps to cartwheels. Braemar Aberdeenshire. The royal family arrives for the Highland Games held on the first Saturday in September.
children present poses of Heather. Then the games begin. In the autumn chill, it's best to sit in the cosy pavilion. The clansmen meet to test their physical strength and to salute the queen, their chieftain. A huge crowd always assembles, hence the name, the Braemar Gathering. And that went over so well indeed, that is the ultimate in caber tossing. That required every bit of experience from Ali Gunn. Then it's back to Balmoral at the end of the day. Once the royal gathering was much larger. The Princess of Wales was a popular addition. Sadly, she no longer attends. She always turned up in a stylish plaid to please the crowd and match the men in kilts. started to go wrong, the Queen Mother, who was ferociously loyal to Charles, always took his side. Diana decided to do her own thing. The Queen Mother could never really work out how Diana could do it and get away with it. And of course, the more Diana did and the more Diana got away with it, the bigger the breach between the two of them. And it was never going to be resolved. And in the end, it's my belief that Diana absolutely hated the Queen Mother. Perhaps unfairly, perhaps unfortunately, but it's true that that was the case. Church, Balmoral. And the congregation overflows when the royal family arrives. Oh, they do like to be beside the D side. She's inherited some money from her father but much more so from her husband, King George VI, who died back in 1952. And at that time, uh, the Queen Mother was considered a very wealthy woman in her own right. But since then, her lifestyle has been uh, very, very extravagant. And that's really, it seems, eaten into her fortune. Five years ago, the Queen Mother put uh, 19 million pounds in trust for mostly her, her great-grandchildren. And a good deal of that is to go to Princes William and Harry in two instalments 
4.9 million when they're 21 and another 8 million to be shared between them when they're 40. So uh, the reason why she may not have a lot of money today is because it's being shunted to one side to avoid inheritance tax. I do think that um, the royal family who have to pick up the bills after all for the Queen Mother um, do slightly worry that she keeps on the central heating at her house, the Castle of May in the north of Scotland, all year round. And she only visits it from time to time, but in order to be able to make sure that the woodwork doesn't contract or that, uh, that nasty damp stains appear anywhere, she will keep that central heating on. The bills are colossal. I think the, uh, the Queen Mother is wonderfully extravagant. She's living in a different age. She is an Edwardian and she lives in an Edwardian way. She has more servants than any other member of the royal family. Uh, she invites people to lunch at Clarence House and says, we'll have a little picnic and uh, you will go out uh, on the lawns and there will be an array of silver and gold and plate on, on the table. There will be footmen behind every chair and you will be served the finest wines and champagne. And that to her is a picnic. Britannia arrives off Scrabston. The Queen and her family are stopping off on the Western Isles cruise to visit the Queen Mother. The Royal Barge brings them ashore just as her car draws up at the dock. There is always a good turnout of locals and tourists to provide a warm Scottish welcome. The Queen greets her mother with a kiss. Followed by Prince Philip. And Prince Edward. They all drive off to the Castle of May for lunch. The castle was bought and restored by the Queen Mother in 1952. All too soon, they return to Scrabster and say farewell. But they will all meet up again soon at Balmoral. The Queen Mother stays at her most northerly home for the last three weeks of August. Then she moves to Burke Hall, near the Queen's Highland home. Britannia sails on to Aberdeen, where the Queen and the Princes disembark and drive on to Balmoral. As a last farewell, the Queen Mother orders rockets fired from the shore, which can clearly be seen at sea. The 16th century castle's jutting towers and corbelled turrets give it a fairy tale appearance. A last view, then with flags flying, Britannia disappears around a headland. The Sandringham Flower Show on a warm day in early August. The Queen Mother never misses it and is always escorted by her eldest grandson. He would go and stay with her at Burke Hall and she would encourage him and um, encourage his taste in music and generally cherish him and I think she saw in him the same sort of vulnerability that her husband had had and they were very close. He was a great favourite with her and I think she encouraged him in many ways that his parents didn't. They were rather conventional. The, the Queen and Prince Philip uh, had very conventional tastes on what young men should be. The Queen Mother appreciated his softer, more artistic side, and I think he, she certainly encouraged him as, as a young man.
Despite the rough ground, the Queen Mother manages to inspect most of the exhibits in the marquees. Many people in the crowd present early birthday gifts to their favorite lady. Then it's time to take the short drive back to Sandringham House. Back in London at Clarence House, where we began, the crowd serenades this very special lady. Some admirers come year after year, often from distant parts of the country, and there is always a heavy contingent of tourists. There are always enough flowers to fill several florist shops. And of course, the press are always on hand. For a brief while, it's goodbye, but 90 minutes later, the gates will open again. It's a rare chance to see the Queen Mother surrounded by her children and grandchildren. Prince Charles and Prince Andrew are alone. Sadly, their wives no longer join the party. Walking may not be easy these days, but after 70 years of public duties, it's not surprising. Another big day, the marriage of her granddaughter, Lady Sarah Armstrong-Jones, to Daniel Chatter. 
To avoid slip-ups, the frail Queen Mother enters and leaves the church via a side door, dodging the steep front steps. London, where a memorial to Canadian servicemen is being unveiled. Under grey skies, the little lady in pink adds a rosy glow to the occasion. On the dais, the Prime Minister is waiting, and there is time for a chat. Royal Navy Commander Prince Andrew is in uniform, sitting beside his sister-in-law. Portsmouth and the 50th anniversary celebrations of D-Day are underway. Heads of state have gathered from all the Allied nations. Members of the royal family have front row seats at an open air service to remember the sacrifice made by so many. Half a century has passed since the Great Armada left this shore to liberate Europe, but the world has not forgotten. In the background, warships slide by as they make their way across the channel in the wake of the D-Day veterans. President Clinton has come to represent the United States forces who played such an important part. As the service ends, he and the First Lady go on walkabout. Hers has been a life of pomp and circumstance, always in the spotlight, with no thought of retirement, no matter how many birthdays come and go. What would such grand occasions be without her? This frail figure remains an enduring symbol of what the monarchy should represent. She is a living link with the Victorian era and has always retained the grace and charm of a bygone age. Down the decades, she has held a unique place in the royal family and in the heart of the nation. Long may it always be so.